All right, here we go. Right. Nope. Wasn't you only as, got one? I know. That was, that was very sad. Yeah, that was. That was really bad. <laughs> if we're already recording, you we need are. to release that. <laughs> <laughs> just put that clip I out. I really just wanted to just, like, have a good knuckle crack to start off the episode. No, not, not, no, not today. Not, not today. today. Hang on. Let's see if. I only got one. <laughs> <laughs> None. I'll do one of my fake knuckle cracks and then I'll just I'll just dub the sound over. So hold on. We'll cheating. do some ASMR real, real quick here. There we go. Oh, yeah, that is cheating. There we go. <laughs> just dub that over later. But what's Fair. up, everybody? <laughs> Welcome to another episode of Team Chat Podcast. I am one of your hosts, Jarrett Wilson, joined by Rachel Mogan. Bonjourno. Bonjourno to you as well. How are you this fine day? I'm doing tired. Tired? But it's a Saturday morning. <laughs> We're know. actually recording on a Saturday morning again, which we haven't done in a while. Well, I had to stay up late playing video games. Oh, yeah, because we yeah. have stuff to talk about we here. We have stuff to talk about. On Team Chat Podcast. A video game show where we talk about games, the ones we love, the ones we hate, and everything in between. New episodes come out Tuesdays, 9 a.m. Central Time, and you can listen to those across podcast services around the World Wide Web, such as Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and others. You can also watch a video version of each episode on our YouTube channel. So head over to Team Chat Podcast, youtube.com slash Team Chat Podcast, where you can watch all of those. Find us on social media, such as Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You can join our Discord server. And finally, if you're really loving and enjoying what we're creating for you each and every week, head over to patreon.com slash Team Chat Podcast, where it's for as little as a dollar a month. You can support the show. In return, we'll give you cool perks like getting the episodes early before the general Tuesday release, access to a private channel on our Discord server specifically for our patrons, and also, if at the it's, it's for our five dollar tier right now, but for Team Chit Chat, you'll get access to that, which is a, a show that we put out to our patrons two weeks before it goes out on its general release. That's just another thing where we don't talk about video games; we talk about any other thing we want to under the sun. Just as another uh, avenue of content for our audience to enjoy, and as a special thank you for our patrons for supporting us. But uh, so again, check that out: Patreon.com/slash Team Chat Podcast. If you can't do that, that's no big deal at all. We totally understand. We're just glad that you're here listening to us, and we appreciate each and every one of you. But it would also really help if you could give us a review, share us on your social media to your friends group, and all that stuff. That would be greatly appreciative as well, and helping us get the show out there because the more listeners means the show gets bigger and better. So exactly. both help us out in the long run, and we thank you very much for all of our listeners and. All of our patrons. Someday we're going to be able to afford a gilded table. How badass that would, be pretty would sweet. that be? That would be pretty Just like sweet. this, like a total, it could even be like a really cool one. Like you see those coffee tables that are like the resin ones that like have Ooh, yeah. stuff embedded in it and it could yeah. be like old game cartridges or I whatever. I was going to say that ours would just be fender furs. <laughs> <laughs> like embedded oh, in it, the Oh, that's table. absolutely what it would be. Absolutely what it would Yeah, be. maybe that's not such a good idea after all. <laughs> <laughs> we would have to like have it made in a sterile lab a hundred miles we away. could not be made here. And we would still find one in it and oh, be like, absolutely. how? Uh, we have taken fenders for wherever we've traveled. Yeah. When Sam and I went to Mexico a few years ago, where they they had to check our bag when we when we arrived there, and they opened it up and they and they and it just immediately just fur came out of everything. And we and they looked at us literally like you have a dog, and we're like, yes, we do. He's a cute little pupper, but we didn't bring him. We just brought half of his body. <laughs> That's that's not him. <laughs> He's not in this bag. <laughs> but I can see, I, I can understand bag. why you would think that. <laughs> <laughs> Offender. Oh, I know he's a silly, silly pup. Before we jump into our main topic of the day, let's get a little bit of news or what's coming out soon in our moment with movie. All kinds of stuff is coming out in February. So just in case you missed it, a couple of things came out this past weekend. Grand Blue Fantasy Versus came out for PlayStation 4 on February 6. Knights and Bikes came out for the Switch on February 6 as well. And Kunai for Switch and PC again on February 6. On February 7th, you had the Turing Test for Switch. And then as of this episode's air date on February 11th, all of the following are out. It's actually only two. I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> it's a <massive laughs> list yeah, just, of two. Yeah, AO Tennis 2 for PlayStation 4, Xbox One, and Switch. That's February 11. Yakuza 5 comes out for PlayStation 4 on February 11th as well. On the 13th, we've got Florence for Switch, PC, and Mac. If I'm not mistaken, that's the game that was a big hit on mobile yeah, a couple it was a years mobile ago, game right? Only, yeah. I'm excited about that because that's one of the very few mobile games that I actually thought, if that weren't on mobile, I would give it a try. Yeah. And now it's not on mobile. So Florence, check it out. That's for Switch, PC, and Mac. Also, they gave it to Mac, so thank you. There you go. Uh, I wonder what the game like that, that that would be one, though, that I still think would be interesting to try out on mobile. Because like yeah. the only one that I've had, I would say, is a... Is a Close experience that that I've that I've enjoyed and really played on mobile was that Valiant Hearts. Oh yeah, and I played that completely through on mobile, which was an interesting experience. I would say not and not my choice, but like I got into it and I tried it because I think the first like one or two episodes of that game were free, or first few chapters, and then you had to like pay to unlock the remaining chapters. But still, like 
I played it and I got into it enough playing it on the phone. It was the perfect game for playing on the phone. I thought like and its gameplay translated very well. So I wonder how, like it'd be curious to try Florence out on the phone as well, even though it's now available across other platforms. I have similar thoughts, but not quite the same experience with that game that I loved that we talked about. It had to be the first year we were doing the show Year Walk. Yes. Yeah, you remember I Year remember Walk? nothing much about it. I just remember the name. That's fine. Uh, I loved and still loved Year Walk. Uh, and if you can find it somewhere, for the love of God, play it. Uh, but I had gotten it on the Wii U. Okay. Uh, wait, was it for Wii? No, it had to be the Wii U at that time. Uh, I, anyways, the point is I bought it for the Wii U, and it turned out to be a much better game than I thought, but it was originally for mobile. Mm. And I frequently wonder, like, would it have been an air quotes better experience if I had played it on mobile or just more true to form? Because you could see in the Wii U version how the mechanics would have translated really well onto mobile. So I would have been interested to have been able to play that game on mobile first. Mm-hmm. So maybe we should be giving more mobile games a try. Maybe so. Not the ones full of microtransactions, but may- maybe like this I mean, Florence game. That's yeah. a lot of them. Let's it's give it a to, shot. Hard to avoid that. Uh, anyways, Florence is out on February 13th, again for Switch, PC, and Mac. Luna the Shadow Dust mm-hmm. is out for PC on February 13th. And then, just in time for Valentine's Day, Street Fighter V Champion Edition. Nice. <laughs> yeah! <laughs> so that comes out on February 14th for PlayStation 4 and PC. Also on the 14th, Darksiders Genesis, another installment in the Darksiders series for PlayStation 4, Xbox One, and Switch. Dreams is out for PlayStation 4 on February 14th. Oh, it's as actually well. officially out now. Maybe that's the let the me check media and make molecules sure. dreams. That's the one that has been like pr- they've been promoting since like it was announced. I want to say like when the PS4 was announced, yeah, it and it's been like, like it's still kept getting pushed, kept getting pushed. They came out with like a beta last year that people have been making some incredible things oh. in. It's really pretty. And now it's actually getting its full release. That's crazy. Like that's been a fu- like an interesting game to follow its journey. It's one I really have no interest in because that kind of game just does not click for me at all where it's, you know, you just create have this blank canvas to create and for whatever reason those games like it's like it's like Minecraft. I'm going to I'm going to I would make like the simplest creations and be like yeah. yeah and then i see somebody who made the full rendering of king's <laughs> landing from from game of thrones in minecraft which is a thing that someone has done and it's insanely detailed and incredible and i'm just like no how can i compete with that well it's not about competition it's about creativity so uh, i know i know but they do the, the stuff that people have made in dreams so far has been ridiculous like making like playable games in it and different things like that it's ridiculous i mean cool. it looks re- i'm just looking at a few stills of it and it looks beautiful like it's not what i would have expected um but yeah uh, from what I've searched just now, it appears to definitely be coming out on February 14th. That's cool. So, Dreams, pick it up. It's been a lifetime. <laughs> it really has. Table manners for PC? The etiquette's guide. The etiquette guide. I guess just in time for Valentine's Day, table manners for PC on February 14th. You're trying to get romance that date. It's probably not actually about etiquette, but we'll see. Yeah. Uh, so, that's everything that is out now and coming soon. Very cool, very cool. You know, speaking of... One of the things we brought up, uh, you were talking about playing it on the Wii U. Some news that did break this week. Oh, yeah. Wait, are you talking about the news that was on our Discord? Yes. Yes. The one about a game we talked about previously. Yes. I am now it Wonderful 101. Is that what it is? The Wonderful, wonderful 101. 101 is getting a remaster or port to the Switch from its, and it was Wii U original. It was Wii, it was a Wii U original, and it was a bonkers game like i feel like i I believe that's the one that i rented like i rented it from the library and uh, like attempted to play it and i was like i have no idea what's happening like i remember bright colors fast action a sweet soundtrack and nothing else Mm -hmm. (laughs) i don't really remember what happened like actually in the game in terms of gameplay i just remember it being a crazy time and i'm really excited to see what arguably is a really niche game still get a port to the switch so thank you kickstarter right like it was it was a kickstarter thing was it i believe so to get it to switch to get it to switch oh okay so it was very much like a fan thing Well, thank you kickstarter yeah it's kind of one of those like sub cult games where most people don't know about it but the, the core the core fans who know about it and if i'm not mistaken wonderful 101 is by platinum games i believe uh, so if you're fans of like the kind of fast paced action that comes along with the Bayonetta series or Near Automata, uh, that's kind of, and I say this very tentatively, kind of what you can expect from Wonderful 101, but it is very different than those games. So watch 
some trailers first to see if you think you might like it. But I just remember that the art style from the the title card or the box art and everything. I was always like, this kind of looks like The Incredibles. Yeah, I am definitely planning to pick it up because I want to actually see if I can, you know, make it further into the game. <laughs> actually play it. Maybe I do remember one of my. Uh, something that I didn't like about it was that at least on the Wii U, and I kind of doubt that they'll really change this, Yeah, because the action is so broad, which you'll see when you kind of look at um, stills of the game like in action, it's sometimes hard to visually keep track of what's happening on screen because there's so much ground being covered and there's so many moving pieces to keep in mind. So for like get a big screen mm. is what I'm saying. Don't play it I, handheld? Yeah, I kind of feel like it might not translate really well to handheld just because if you're old like me and you have old failing eyes, you need a big screen to play that game on. But anyways, I'm excited about that and I'm really glad to see such uh, such an unusual game get a second wind. And if you want to hear more or watch more about the wonderful 101, jump on back, jump into a time capsule, go way on back to episode 64 Oh man! Of really? Team Chat Podcast, 64. underrated games where oh, Mogan talks about the one for one hundred and one in more detail. Oh my gosh! I'm gonna have to go back and watch it and just like, what did I think about it? Because I kind of don't remember. I know, right? It was. I mean, episode sixty four. That was way back there. What year was that? Uh, would, was that eighteen? That would have been in our second year. So two years ago. Eighteen. Eighteen. Okay. Yeah. 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 I think. That seems right. I don't know. But yeah, Anyways, it was way back, it was ways back there. Episode 64, and here we sit, episode 196. Oh my God. Almost that, episode 200, everybody. Ooh, Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> I know, that's crazy, We've been right? We've here too long. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's go ahead and jump into some of the main things that we were wanting to talk about. Mogan has prepared for us, uh, just as a little preview. Uh, she has prepared for us some first impressions of Remedy's Control, which I'm super excited about because it's one that we both missed on playing last year when the game came out. Uh, but still, have heard nothing but good things about the game, so I'm very curious to see, but I've yet to play any of it, so I'm very excited to hear w what your thoughts on the game are so far. But uh, before we jump into that, though, I recently was inspired from last week's episode, honestly, where we were talking with were my brother-in-law, Michael Boyd. Were we ripped you Boyd. a new one? <laughs> it wasn't as much of a ripping of a new one, rather ju than just a... Did the peer pressure finally get to you? <laughs> I don't know. I don't really know what made me want to pick it up again. But uh, after talking about it for the brief little bit when uh, we were talking with my with our guest Michael Boyd last on last week's episode, and he was talking about uh, playing Breath of, they just got a Switch and he's playing Breath of the Wild, talking about it again, I picked up the game after that episode, and I have to say, third time's a charm, it finally clicked. Are you finally having I'm fun? I'm finally having fun. Oh with my it. gosh, I'm I so don't know happy. what necessarily even changed this time. All I know is he talked about, I was like, you know what? Okay, I'm going to give this another shot. I'm going to see if I can, what can happen once I get past Varuta and everything like that. And I'm going to actually beat Varuta because that's where I got before. I got to Water Blight Ganon fighting him in, in Fine Beast Varuta, and I just couldn't beat him. It's actually a pretty hard, air quotes, first boss. You yeah. know, the game actually isn't linear. You can do the different Divine Beasts in any order but the game kind of naturally pushes you or suggests you right. to go to Varuta first. And Waterblade Ganon, I still think, is the hardest one. Well, because, Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, good. Then the rest should be easy peasy. The rest are easy peasy. Oh, like, good. in comparison to Waterblade, it's like, oh, no, this is a uh, Well, because, yeah, he's got park. that. He throws the spear. He can, like, extend it super hella far. And so you got to play, like, really far back from him and, and try to damage it and run up to him and do as much damage as you could. But I, I guess I'm... But I was really happy that I only had three hearts when I beat him. I was pretty happy about Why that. Why you have so few hearts? Because I'm still not playing it totally right, I oh guess. Oh my gosh, you got to do <laughs> more temples, hearts now. bro. <laughs> oh, geez, Wait, okay, so that was going to be my question. I just got another three spirit orbs from okay. doing shrines. Those what I turn in to get... Yes. Okay, that's what I thought. So once you get spirit, when you get spirit orbs from shrines, you can then take them to goddess statues. So most uh, towns will have a goddess statue, and there are a few just kind of spread out around the map. So you can go to any of the goddess statues and basically redeem your okay. orbs. That's what I thought. For either more stamina or more life. And more life is yes. more important than stamina. I already have like a little like extra notch of stamina. Okay. I, I kind of feel like stamina, at least for me, was more useful because I'm, you know, I wanted to climb everything all the time. Right. And you need a lot of stamina for that. But stamina is arguably easier to supplement with your cooking and mm. your food. Yeah. So it just depends on how you want to play. Okay. Really, okay. one isn't better than the other. They are both useful. Well, so, th I mean, that's a big thing, though. I think I'm finally able, I'm. it's finally clicking with me to utilize all the different skill sets I have, not rely on being, like, up, up close and bashing it out with them, I, you know, using bombs, using arrows. Uh, I still cannot get the dodge... 
parry, like the flurry strike thing. Remember, oh, like yes. jumping backwards. It's that's really the right. Tricky. That's hard. Uh, it's the best feature in the game, in my opinion, because yeah. it's so fun. And when you get it right, you get it so right. But it really is like split second of you have it's to you have to perfect. time it really well. Yeah. There's no like like window of like parry here or whatever. No, it's it literally like really you have to hit that you. menu that you have to hit it just at the right point. You just have and I guess to you have to be like the right distance away too or actually the distance is pretty forgiving. Okay. Um I've done it at what I feel like was outside of the like the hitbox for the flurry to actually take in to go into effect and it still worked. I mm-hmm. think it's much more about the timing of you just have to watch when an enemy is swinging at you and get it just right in response. Mm. Okay. So I need more practice there. But I've gone through uh, a defeated water blight gun this time, like I said, so that was really cool. And I think what it was actually this time is they tell me, you know, that you need like 20 shock arrows mm. and everything. Well, I started, I had found shock arrows before I was doing that mission on one of my original playthroughs. So I wound up like using them because I thought like, Oh, I've got them. I got to use them now. And they're not realizing they're in actually pretty short supply. So once I was actually able to activate, you know, you do that part where you have to get thrown up into the air and then you shoot the oh, things on right, right, with right. the shock arrows first. So I had done that before and I like had just enough to get through that. But then on the first time I played through this time, I was able to save enough arrows and I only used them then. And then I didn't use the shock arrows again until I got to actually fighting water blight Ganon in that second part of it where he's, you know, it raises the pedestals up out of the water. So you have to actually swim. So that way, you know, to save time once I would actually knock him out, then I'd start hammering him with those shock arrows, took him out really quick. A very good plan. I think it only took me maybe uh, like, 12 tries, I think. <laughs> that's actually not that bad for only having three hearts. I know. Yeah. Like, uh, the very first, uh, like, and that's what I mean. Like, I think the combat of it and how to actually play the game, for whatever reason, is clicking with me better this time than it ever has before. And I'm actually having fun. So that is very exciting. I am super happy to hear that. So proud of you. Yes. Hashtag proud. Can we play it more this week? <laughs> I woke up this morning and played for a little bit. Um, I just did actually a shrine this morning. The one where you have to fight a, a little mini guardian that has like the, oh, the yeah, battle axe. Oh yeah, a minor axe. test of strength. And a, yeah, <laughs> has a battle axe and a, and a shield and everything. And he was kind of difficult, but I, I figured out his moves and beat him already too. So. I love the little guardians. I feel like they are so cute and they just kind of scuttle around. Oh, they're <laughs> like crabs. Yeah, they are. They're like weird little crabs. <laughs> yeah. Um, in like similar like juxtaposition because you've already beaten the game that I'm about to talk about and I've already beaten the game that you're playing right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I've been going back and actually bothering to attempt to finish Ori in the Blind Forest on so the good. Switch. I'm so glad. I'm so glad so you're finally playing this I, game. I did take a little bit of a break kind of halfway through for pretty similar reasons because I felt like the mechanics aren't really like clicking with me. Mm-hmm. I'm having an okay time but not a great time. Wow. And it was because I had hated that entire section with like the mysterious forest or whatever like the foggy misty place that shifts around and it's like the forest of illusion oh, or something okay. i think you know yeah, I, anyways I the part. point is i hated that section mm-hmm. and i just felt really underpowered i was like this ca- why is this so hard i feel like i'm missing something or something's just not going right for me so i was like frustrated so i put it down for a little while yeah but then i took it back up actually bothered to really make a solid effort to go back backtrack and like explore other areas that i hadn't explored yet because were were you finding all the like extra things yes but not to the extent that i could have been Mm. like i definitely could have benefited from a little bit more exploration which is what i did Mm. so after i had beaten um like i went back finished the misty forest place then finished like sorrow pass and which then unlocks like Mount Horu. So before I went to Mount Horu, I went back yeah. and like actually bothered to go to all of the areas, even some areas that I hadn't been to at all. Uh, and I got a ton of the upgrades. I fleshed out the entire ability tree. I have all the abilities. Oh, really? Now. Yes. I don't even think I did that. So I went like I got everything. Nice. <laughs> uh, I don't think I have a hundred percent. There are still a few of the really small ability chunks that I don't have yet. But also I don't care because I maxed out the tree. So right. whatever. So you You've got all the moves uh, and everything. Yeah, and I finally made it to Mount Horu. Uh, it was really hard at first, but I finally did the thing where, like, you get to the top, and then you unlock more things as you kind of cascade back down. Yes. Oh, my yes. God, that part was hard. I think it's such, like, a really cool, I guess, just, like, 
real time structure of a volcano where you just go straight up like you have to just shoot your way to the top and then you kind of do this like tiered cascading down as you explore more of the mountain itself which what a fun because you have fun to like concept. block up lava flows yes, that unlock all these other parts exactly yeah. I think it's a really well designed level and now that I'm obviously very OP because I have everything I'm like this is easy uh, just wait <laughs> now I'm having just a great wait. time it's gonna be although I, I imagine if I had had more abilities that that part because that's the one that has like the fire orbs that like shoot out like the straight lines and you're like spinning oh, yes. and all this. Okay, those things suck. Right? I they hate can go those. To hell. Yeah, those those <laughs> that never mind. I have some choice words. Well, for to, those yeah, creatures. We'll to, well, I, I'm very excited to hear because you are getting close to the I'm end. I'm almost done. So I'm very excited to hear about your thoughts about especially the ending of the game, how it does set up for Will the Wisp. Yeah. And um and all this stuff and just what you think of the final because that's one of the things I think I what made me love it the, a lot too is that there aren't necessarily boss battles, but boss gauntlet runs. Yeah, it's you like know? a boss. It's like a rush. It's like yeah, it's like a like a you have an obstacle course basically that you have to do in lieu of fighting bosses, which I I like. I think it's it's a fun different. It thing It just about makes it. so much more sense in the context of the game yes. because Ori's not really like sure Ori fights and it's powerful, but only because it kind of has to like yeah. it doesn't really have a choice but like bosses aren't a thing instead it's more like the environment is what you're fighting against right. which is the the context of the game because so it's the, like yeah the environment is your enemy because yeah. it's the forest is dying and all the in all the stuff and you've got to restore its you life have to and restore everything. the balance i think my hardest part uh, i think i told you this already my my part that i was just like one that was kicking my ass is the part right before mount Har- horu when it's like the windy valley or i can't remember the exact name but it's where the wind oh yeah the valley of wind valley of wind is like blowing up and you it's where you learn to do the glide move and all that yes. stuff but between those damn dive bombing birds and then the like green frog guys. Oh were, God, those frogs! Who would spit like a poison ball at you? Those frogs. Those suck. things. It would take what? like two hits. With yeah. even if you redirected their poison ball back to them, like it still would take like two hits to kill them. They fire super quick, so you have like zero recovery time if you miss. Those freaking frogs. God, those guys suck. Th- that might be like the worst enemy in the game. <laughs> yeah, I think so. I really I think so. Frogs. I got one point and I saved because you can do you can make, create yeah, you a can save, save point anywhere. at any at any part, which I also really like. But one time I did it. I made one in a terrible place right next to like three of those guys. You so idiot. I couldn't go up. I couldn't go to the side. And so like each time I'd have to be like, okay, here we go. And bust out of the, the save when it loaded up and just start going and be like, and it took forever to get out of that spot to be able to resave. Yeah. So far, my but. favorite part, probably the next time we talk about it will be the last time we talk about it because I'm almost done. We're yeah. probably going to do like my final thoughts, etc. But the part that I just we more do, like, recently right finished. Out, yeah, so we, we can, should. Like, yeah. That's a good idea. I'll time it. I'll time it well. Um, but the part that I really enjoyed so far the most in the game is I kind of assumed that what, what's it called? Like the moonlit grove or like the moon cave. It's the area where you like enter it and it has a statue at the front front of naru and her like dad Mm. because you're basically backtracking to like where naru came from yep and when you initially go into that area it's really dark like it's dark Mm -hmm. and there's kind of like a little bit of bioluminescence here and there but it's really hard to navigate because most of the level is just really obscured and you kind of can't tell where you're going i assumed that I just didn't have an ability yet to like light my way. So for a long time, I didn't go there at all. I was like, okay, I just clearly don't have the thing yet that I need to get here. But then as I was backtracking after Sorrow Pass, I had almost everything. And I was like, okay, this clearly can't be the case. I have almost all the stuff. Mm -hmm. I've been everywhere and I still don't have like a flashlight feature. So clearly I'm just like not navigating the level the right way. So I went back to that area, actually bothered to, you do just have to navigate it. Like there, it's intended to be dark, but you later like get an ability, you get like a little orb to be able to light your way more or less. Because I think that I'm might sure be one of the areas. That. I remember that area, but I think similarly, I didn't have the right stuff to be able to explore it fully. So I don't think I've actually completed that part. Uh, you should. I know go- I finished the map with like, I, there were areas that I still needed to go back I, to. I would I definitely recommend going back to that area specifically. I, I'm pretty sure it's called like the Moonlight Grove or something. And then it leads into the Lost Grove, which is kind of like Naru's backstory and just little brief snippets of where she grew up and such. The reason I say go back to that best track in the game. Oh, really? I think Lost Grove has the prettiest soundtrack in the game. Which is... 
and, and a it's, bold statement it's because really of how hard great to this... pick just one but like just the the music that plays in lost grove i think is beautiful so 10 out of 10 would lost grove again uh, and obviously you get little snippets of naru which is adorable so mm-hmm. definitely if you haven't played that particular section in ori it is technically optional uh please do for two reasons a the soundtrack b you get the dash ability and the dash ability is the best one in the game you can go everywhere so fast so yeah or in the blind forest having a great time good, finally. good, good. so tell me about control so control sorry i have to talk so much today um unfortunately i have such a you've got great thoughts and opinions i, I love have such a them. broad range of games that i play <laughs> um so i will preface this by saying i am going to really only be control i think is a very story-driven game. And I really don't want to spoil too much for anyone. So really kind of the only things I'm going to be talking about are what would largely be considered kind of the first part of the game and or the basic tutorial okay. where you're getting set up, you're getting the backstory, you're kind of meeting your core characters and you're getting your necessary equipment that is the setup to the rest of the game. So nothing that I'm going to talk about is extremely spoilery. I am going to be talking about a bit of the backstory that you learn at the start of the game, but none of that is going to go past maybe like hour one to two okay, cool. of your in-game experience. And that is for two reasons. A, you want to play it. I do. And I'm going to let you borrow my copy afterwards, so I don't want to spoil it for you. And B, I don't want to spoil it for anybody, because this is clearly the kind of game that the less you know about it, the more fun I think you're going to have. So uh, initial impressions are really good. Uh, I'll just go on ahead and say that right off the bat. I kind of want to, rather than trying to describe the game to you, I want to like sell the game to you. Okay, okay. So I'm just going to like paint you the scene of like how it starts out because it's so fantastic. So first of all, this isn't really part of the scene. I just kind of want to give you like the color scheme that you need in your head. The game's color scheme as evidenced by its box art, black, white, and red. Okay. Those are the only three colors you need and like a little bit of blue every now and then. But mostly black, white, and red, like a really powerful in-your-face color scheme. Uh, and the, 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 I was going to say the movie. The game starts with an edifice, the, the outside of a building. Okay. And you're hearing a woman's voice as she has uh, like what seems to be an internal dialogue with herself but you're thinking, is she talking to someone? But there's no other voice, it's just her. And she's talking about how in life, there's, you know, she's basically describing how the world works. And she says, we look at life and you think that it's a room and there's a poster on the wall. And all that there is of the room, uh, all that there is of the world is you and the room and the poster. And that's it, that's reality, that's the world. But what if that was a lie? What if that's not true? What if, and she makes a reference to it, but doesn't quite state it. She says, what if, much like that prison movie, she's talking about Shawshank Redemption, but clearly like they don't say it, but she's like, oh yeah, it's that prison movie. I can't remember the name of that guy. I really laughed at that part. She was like, what if behind the poster, there's a hole to something else. And every now and then from behind the poster, things get out Mm. and it's like oh this is pretty creepy and the whole scene is very creepy it's dark it's raining a little i think so during this internal dialogue the scene is kind of swooping into this building edifice uh, that is just a city it's bleak you know very black and gray and like a little bit of white here and there Uh, and as she kind of ends her internal monologue you are her then Uh, and you are oh god what jesse i was gonna say jane your name is jesse fat if jesse faden it's F A D E N. So it's yeah, either Faden. Fadden or Faden. Oh, Madden Faden. I would say That's, Faden. That seems yeah. more appropriate. Faden just makes me think of Madden, and I don't want to think about that. So. <laughs> sports ball. Good sports ball. <laughs> In the game. I'm about to have a stroke. <laughs> okay. Anyways. So you are Jesse Faden, and the game plays in third person. So you see her as you are her. It's not first person. Uh, and you are outside of a building called the Federal Burrow of Control. And the kind of scheme that I think is 
really meant to be kind of evoked here is that of a, a deeply bureaucratic building that seems to be styled very much on the era of what I would guess is the 60s and the 70s. Because things are new, you know, they've got monitors, they've got like one of those uh, security gates with mm-hmm. like the metal detector and stuff. So it's clearly not, it, it probably isn't the 60s and the 70s and Jesse's outfit doesn't seem to imply that. But you're walking into this federal bur- bur- you of control and it kind of seems like they are still a little stuck in the past just in terms of what they their interior design choices let's say so the scene is so creepy you walk into the federal bur- you of control and you know that jesse is there for a reason based on her internal dialogue she she appears to be looking for something or there's some sort of mystery that she's trying to solve and she's like finally found mm. the federal bur- you of control and she's like it was right here under my eyes the whole time hiding in plain sight so you know that there's some sort of mystery here and it's really gripping right off the bat uh the voice acting for starters is amazing i think that this might be one of those games that heavily used mocap and i believe look up for me who the actress that plays jesse is because she's i saw her name in the credits and i was like i'm gonna remember that and then i didn't remember it i feel like i've heard who it is so it's like carol caroline Carol Danvers. Courtney Hope. Courtney Hope. That's what I said. Not Carol Danvers. <laughs> <laughs> Not Captain Marvel. <laughs> Anyways, Courtney Hope uh, plays Jesse Faden, and she does a phenomenal job. Uh, the performance is really 10 out of 10. Uh, but Jesse walks into the Federal Bureau of Control, and it appears to be completely empty. There's no one at the front desk. There's no one at the security station. There's no one in the booth at the security station. And it is dead quiet like it's very creepy there's really no ambient sounds other than your footsteps on the tile floors the interior is very like black like that black tiled interior that a lot of banks or other types of corporate buildings have so you're walking around the lobby and you're like where is everybody and there's nobody there at all Mm -hmm. no enemies no sound no nothing so you walk through security and you kind of check the security booth and my favorite thing about control so far far is that the details are wonderfully done. So if you actually bother, you don't have to, but if you bother to walk into the security booth, uh, which you can just freely do, you don't have to get anything to be able to do that. Inside the security booth are like a few security monitors and they don't have any camera footage on them. Instead, they say things like security breach level four, multiple breaches detected in sector, whatever. Mm -hmm total lockdown. So you know without having interacted with anyone or anything that this is a building under lockdown, something is going on, there's all kinds of shit that I haven't experienced yet, but I know something bad is going down. So you basically leave the lobby, you walk up some stairs, again, no interference, nothing blocking your path, you're just in this building walking around. So you go upstairs to kind of the more uh, office type areas. And as you're walking through one of the main lobbies, kind of overlooking uh, the main lobby, like the level, the the dias, the, the the dais? Dais. dais. Yeah, the dais. Uh, up in that area are a bunch of portraits on the wall, like paintings. And you see them during the opening sequence. And here you can just see them again. Of the director, who I believe his name is Zacharias Trench. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, it's definitely Trench. First name, maybe Zacharias, maybe not. I think I'm right about that. Zachary. It's Zachary Trench. It's not Zacharias. <laughs> Anyways, there's director Zachary Trench. And then there's like a random painting of what appears to be like a janitor viewed from behind. So it's like the burr you at work. Uh, and then you see okay, a portrait okay. of somebody else and it's like Dr. Casper Darling. And he like wearing a lab coat and he looks very official. But again, total silence. No one is around. You're just kind of walking walking through this completely dead, empty place. Most of the lights are also in that state of being like kind of dimmed, like offices are after they've closed. So you walk a little bit further back into the Buryu, and something that, again, the details are phenomenal. So when you walk like just around the corner and you're really starting to get into the core of the Buryu of like, this is where people work that the public doesn't usually see. A uh, couple of things that I really love, you can pick up like a document or something. There's all kinds of documents laying around that you can pick up and it adds them to your like collection. Mm-hmm. Uh, and if you, I highly recommend that you read the documents that you actually pick up. You like have to go to your menu and read them because they are chock full of 
fascinating story components that like make the game. I think they're phenomenal. One of the first things that you pick up is a memorandum like from the lobby area. And it's a memo to all personnel about what you can and cannot bring into the Bur you. Oh. And it's like, as a reminder, you are not allowed to bring in weapons, like normal stuff. Weapons, fireworks, uh, smartphones, smart watches, smart uh, music players. And then it actually has another bullet point of anything smart and like in air quotes. It's like, okay. And then at the bottom of that list was a really creepy one that I like sat there and looked at for a long time because I was like, what could that mean? Yeah. It said something to the extent of nothing that is a recognizable object in the collective public conscience. And what it referenced in parentheses were, for example, no rubber duckies, no ketchup bottles, nothing that I guess anyone could see and immediately like know and recognize what it was. Regardless of where they were from. Regardless of where they were from. And I was like, why? Why can't you bring those things into the Buryu? And then you get a little bit further back and that is so wonderfully complimented by the vending machines because the vending machines are full of like trail mix, pistachios, you know, chips, Yeah. but they're all in non-branded plain white packaging. Interesting. And it's like, oh, there's no brands back here. Why not? Does that have to do with the memo that I read? And then if you actually go to like their little random billboard that all offices have, and it's mm-hmm. just like where you put, oh, my kids selling Girl Scout cookies and that kind of stuff. Those types of things are on the billboard, but so is a little, uh, a, a, a little poster about remember to wash your hands and it's like that's normal and then you look further down the poster and it's like failure to do so spreads the mold and you're like what does that mean what's oh, no. the mold yeah seriously <laughs> and it's really ominous and i just loved the setup and the world building immediately this was in like the first 15 minutes nice. i mean 10 if you were walking fast So I love the world building just straight off the bat. You get a little bit further around the corners of the Buryu. You're going through some some like conference rooms. You're not really finding anything except for, you know, little memos. There's no objects to pick up other than like random documents. Mm -hmm. And then you hear like somebody singing and you're like, oh. <laughs> into building somebody's scene that's not yeah, a good sign. That can never be good no so i was like immediately very scared because it's also like really dark and it's kind of a creepy game and it's like, i'm gonna die but you round a corner and it's just the janitor you're like oh oh but, but still what's but, this janitor doing by himself see, the in this thing empty is, building he's facing away from you oh, it's no. like this is bad no this is bad. yeah no, no, guys, no, no no and it's dark it's like dark and he's singing and mobbing the floor i've seen horror movies i've played some yeah, resident evil exactly I, I know this is gonna be bad but the game does a great thing where it kind of turns that on turns that um entire setup on its head where you approach the janitor and he turns around very slowly and you're like it's gonna be a zombie and he's not oh he's just a regular old guy okay. it's like oh hi there and he introduces himself I can't remember what his name is. It's something that seemed, and his accent would imply that he may have been of Eastern European descent. Okay. His name is like Alta or Alka. Halka? I'll have to look it back up. The point is, he's actually just a nice old janitor. Okay. And he does say some weird shit to you, and you're like, what? Oh, I've seen some things. Yeah, he's, it's like, what does that mean, Mr. Janitor? Uh, but uh, he t- he's talking to you, and he doesn't seem surprised to see you at all. He And he actually kind of says to you, like, oh, you're here for the interview. You're, gonna, you're applying to be the assistant janitor, right? And you're like a pretty official-looking woman with like a cool leather jacket on, so it's like you're probably not here for the interview. Yeah, her character design's awesome. And also, nobody's in this building, so probably I'm not here to be assistant janitor. Him, but he's like, you'll work for me, and he's like, really nice. And he's Still. like, all you have to do is for the interview, go back there and go up the elevator. Uh, it's just around the corner to the left. Um, and she, Jesse, is like, sure, okay, we'll do. And Jesse doesn't seem put off by this old janitor at all. She's like, nope. And then when you finish your conversation with him. The game is very interspersed with Jessie's internal dialogue between herself and this other thing that never talks back, but you eventually realize that she is talking to something that I guess is only within her. Yeah. What is it? Unknown. Uh, But she's talking to herself after you talk to the janitor, and she's like, you know what? You might think he's an axe murderer, but I'd take him over a hundred other people. Basically setting up like, no, I trust this guy. Uh, This is a, she refers to him as a friendly face. And it's like, why do you know him? 
what have you been here before mm-hmm. so it's really just the the mystery is ramping up you know by leaps and bounds just it's very in such smooth fashion so you do as he says you go around a couple more corners and you're looking for the elevator you take the elevator you go to level i don't know something you get off the elevator and you are progressing further into the buryu and what happens oh i'm trying to like make sure that i get the order of events right I don't recall exactly if I'm missing something, but the next thing that happens, oh yeah, so you start to find uh, a lot more memos and documents that kind of shed more light on the fact of the Buryu being under total lockdown. Mm -hmm. At one point you find like an empty security booth, but an alarm is blaring inside and you're like, why is the alarm going off? But again, there's no one else there. It's just all kinds of mystery. Uh, You round a couple more corners, you wind up in this big kind of open space where there are a lot of like, you know those bankers' desks Mm -hmm. where it's like the little green lamp on top of it? There's a bunch of those all over the place, but again, no people. People, and things are kind of in disarray. Like there are documents kind of strewn about all over the place. So things look a little off, but not totally off. Okay. What you do find uh, at the far end of this room is a massive metal sliding door that says like safe room number six. And it's like maximum capacity, six people. And it's like, why do you need this safe room in the middle of your Buryu building? What is this about? So you can actually open the safe room because this particular one doesn't have any occupants in it. You just push a button and the door slides back and you go in and it's just an empty room. And you're like, okay, that's pretty weird. I don't really know what's going on here, but it's, it's like a bunker. It's full of bunk beds and like little supply stashes. And you're like, why would they need this? in a public office building. Yeah. So you make a little bit more progress, and this is the point is where I might tell somebody that wants to play the game to maybe stop listening, because this is still really early game, but it is kind of mildly very spoilery. Uh, mildly spoilery. Skip ahead. Um, again, it's just set up. You enter, and you actually saw this um, in flashes in the beginning, like, opening sequence of the game. Uh, you... Uh, go a little bit further down a couple of halls and you hear a noise Mm. come out of what is labeled the director's office, but the doors are shut. And you, but you heard something and you're like, oh, what could that have been? So you go to investigate the director's office and you open the door and he's dead. Oh. So he is lying on the floor in a pool of blood. You can tell from the scene that he probably shot himself. Okay. And that was also referenced in the opening sequence. You see him, the director, raise a gun to his head. So you know he shot himself. So Jesse walks in. She's like, shit, shit, shit. What is going on here? Because she doesn't really know what's happening either. But you go to the director and you, you're looking at him and you're like, what happened? here and there's a gun lying next to him and Jesse's kind of talking to herself and or the thing that is with her and she's like should I pick up the gun and you pick up the gun and the gun is a special thing Ooh. so when you pick up the gun you are immediately kind of pseudo transported to this other world and it's the tutorial oh okay <laughs> so you uh, you learn to jump you learn how to climb ledges you learn how to use your gun and mm-hmm. it's really just like a big pistol um, it's not anything fancy it's not a shotgun it's just like a regular pew pew gun a regular pew yeah, gun yeah I was about to say that transported you into an alternate world for exactly. a tutorial and the alternate world is fascinating because it's like all these big Big blocky black glass edifices mm-hmm. just in, in nothingness just kind of in space and the enemies that you fight in the tutorial are just like these little shadow creatures that you kind of beat up uh, your basic mechanics are you have a melee that you can use with triangle mm-hmm. which the melee in and of itself is really unusual because it implies immediately that Jessie has powers of some sort because it's not like she just punches people she kind of does like a big hand in the air and it seems to cause like a bit of a blowback okay so she's already powerful. Like if you bap something a couple of times with your melee, it's probably going to die. Uh, the gun is really easy to use. Hold R2 to aim, uh, uh, L2 to shoot. End of story. Headshots do more damage. Body shots do less damage. Very simple. Mm-hmm. Uh, your jump is X. The controls are very intuitive. Anyone who has played video games will think, yeah, this is perfectly in line with everything I know. You can sprint. My one complaint so far about the game your natural walking speed is too fast. Really? 
okay, I like I feel too fast. If I'm doing Jesse's normal speed walking where you tilt the L stick all the way up, she's too fast. So I frequently find myself holding it at like awkwardly only half tilt, which is a conscious decision I have to make because I want to walk slowly. It's a creepy game and I mm-hmm. want to experience it as a creepy game. Uh, but that's my one very minor complaint. Uh, so you go through t- the tutorial and something creepy is happening the whole time that you're in the tutorial. You keep getting this other dialogue and it's kind of like a voice that is many voices and it's like a low mumble uh very much recommend that you play with the subtitles on because otherwise even if you have full hearing which i don't i don't think you would be able to tell what sort of these background voices are saying okay so play it with the subtitles i think that's for the best so you're hearing a voice and the subtitles describe it as the board so the board is talking to you and it's like, who's the board? Why does the board sound like many people and no people all at once? Ooh. And the board is like kind of talking in pieces. It's not really making sense, but it's, it's referring to you. You kind of eventually realize as the new director, it's like, oh, it picked up the gun. It can wield the gun. Oh, okay. It's the new director. And it's talking about you, and you're like, who's the new director now? <laughs> Beg pardon? It's kind of like an Excalibur situation. Yeah, you pick up the exactly. thing. Exactly. It, it it's you, really funny makes you that the leader. you... It's really funny that you mentioned that, because after you get out of the tutorial, you find, I think, in... In the in the previous in trenches in the previous director's office, you find like a piece of media that is an old film reel, and this is something that I love that the game did. It's kind of portal esque in that it both is it, it's funny, but I don't think it's meant to be exclusively humorous. Mm-hmm. But it's just kind of funny in that like oh this is kind of really out of place and like very jauntily toned in what is clearly a dire situation. It's a film reel that is by Dr. Casper Darling, who is one of the lead you guess researchers of this facility, uh, and he is explaining on screen with two assistants behind him objects of power and altered world events awes and you rapidly get the feeling that this is like x files Mm -hmm. the the series fringe it's like yeah it's very weird science and it's like oh i'm all about this this is awesome so in this film reel it's just three normal people it's like three normal humans it's they they just filmed three normal people and then put it in the video game and it's like that's That's hysterical so it's done like an old 60s style kind of psa of like hey these are objects of power and we're going to describe them to you and dr castle Jasper Darling is holding the object of power and on screen he's got these big rubber gloves on so that he can't touch it at all. Mm -hmm. And it's just this little black cube and it just looks like a cube. It doesn't do anything, but he's like, if the, if you're the one that can wield an object of power, you're it. Oh, and if you're not, you're fired. (laughs) And it's really funny. (laughs) It's hysterical, but you, you gather through the context clues and through this little uh, introduction and through some memorandums that the gun that you have picked up from the previous director is an object of power. Mm. It's a legendary object of power, which you learn from some of the documents because it states, oh yeah, previous uh, objects of power have included Excalibur, Mjolnir. Yeah, and it goes through like these lists of like historic, uh, mostly folklore type objects that are objects of power. Uh, So it, it does just such an amazing job of linking past to present it's like oh it takes on the form of you know whoever the current wielder is which explains why in the present it's a gun oh, okay so it kind of moves around too like the gun isn't entirely solid it doesn't seem it's kind of has parts that shift around every now and then so it's definitely not just a normal gun it is in fact this legendary object of power and by picking it up and by being able to wield, wield it you as jesse are the new director very cool and that's kind of all I really want to say. Okay. Other than that, you do learn through her internal dialogue that Jesse is at the federal bar you have control because something happened in her past, and this is really funny, like very X Files. She's from a town, a town called Ordinary. So she's from the town of Ordinary, uh, and when she was a child, apparently something happened there, which you get you get the sense it was an altered world event. Something that you would say is very unordinary something that is very 
extraordinary. <gasps> so something happened in her hometown that was like devastating to her. She keeps referencing like what happened to me. So you know that something bad happened in her childhood. It probably had to do with an altered world event. And she knows that the federal bur you have control covered it all up. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like this very X-Files thing where there's stuff happening, but there's a government agency specifically to track and cover that stuff up. You also know that she is at the federal bur you have control because 17 years ago, presumably when the Altered World event happened, her younger brother Dylan was taken oh. by the Federal Bureau of Control. So she hasn't seen him in 17 years. She has no idea what happened to him. She's at the Buryu primarily to find Dylan, but also to find answers about what happened to her. So that's as much as I really want to say about it. It plays really well. Uh, very minor complaints. Uh, again, the walking speed is too fast, which is really just me. That's probably just a me problem. Uh, some very small, minor mechanical things that I noticed that were just a little silly, not mm -hmm. really annoying. You clip through inanimate objects real hard. Oh, like really? if I run into like a drink cart, I take the whole cart with me and it's like clipped into my body. Oh, whoops. So certain, uh, certain inanimate objects will interact with you in qu not quite the right way, but it doesn't like inhibit you. It's mm -hmm. just a silly little thing that you're like, whoops, picked up a, a drink cart with me got to jump out of it uh you do eventually get into some combat obviously now that you have a gun i don't want to talk too much about that because it gives too much away it is a lot of it a lot of the gameplay of it i've yes. seen bits of that and i know it seems again uh, it's having not played and just what i've seen other people play it it, it seems very matrix Esque? We we will say that tentatively. Okay. So I do want people to be able to experience that kind of stuff themselves. I think you're going to have more fun with it that way. That what I've talked about really probably only covers maybe the first thirty minutes to an hour. Okay. So I think that you can still have many surprises in store uh, if you've listened to all of this. But to pick it up, I feel like Control got a lot of critical acclaim, but not much public acclaim. Well, it was up for like Game of the Year at it, Game Awards, but and that's it what was I'm up saying. for a lot of critical different acclaim. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but I, I feel like in terms of people, I really didn't hear that many people directly around me talking about control a lot. I and I the, feel like it should be. I want to say the only people I know, uh, the only people I know in my circle who have played it are you and my buddy Michael. Um, and Destroya, I think, mentioned it. Oh, on yes, the yes, yes. He did. Yes. He did. Um, and he loved it. So, yeah. But it seems one things I've heard about it, too. Again, not wanting to to spoil too much for people who haven't, it ties in, apparently it has some connections to another game universe. Ooh, okay. And, the, and that I think falls in line with his, I with swear his to God, likes. If it's Uncharted, I will no, sue. No, it's not that. Okay. <laughs> I think I think you'll be, if you don't know what I'm talking about, which I, I won't say anymore, but I think once you draw are able to draw the connections to which, ser which thing I'm talking about, okay. you'll be like, okay, I'm into this. So this, I will say, Having not played Control, having seen maybe five minutes of gameplay, you have created the perfect image in my head. You have been the Bob Ross to my canvas, to my blank canvas, and painted this beautiful picture of what this game is, and I'm totally in. Uh, I need to play this immediately. You might even sounds, not. You might not even. You might not even want to wait for me to I finish might it. Might not. You might as well just go buy. It. Honestly, I probably should play it and play and it through, and then we could do a, a, a wrap up. Like together yeah. episode. That's what we should do. Oh, that's what we should do. Because this very much sounds to me of how you're describing the game. Like the atmosphere of this game seems like it's a very solid mix of things. Like when you're talking about just uh, the opening parts of it, exploring the empty uh, building and everything like that and going through there, it very much gave me hints of like what Prey was. Yes. Actually, it also uh, reminded me a lot of some of Bioshock. With some of its like, you know, like I abilities actually, and things like that. And then like even a little bit with like the, the training videos and stuff like that, even a little bit of fallout with with how maybe. at the beginning of only in that in that not saying it's like fallout, but fallout does that a lot where it's like, here's these like funny, like old tutorial how to's of what the world it explains the world that you're in. Uh, I will say that I had the thought that this feels kind of like prey. I also had that thought when I was playing it. So I think that it's probably better than prey oh, already okay. just right, based on right. what I've experienced so far. Um, just because it's a really clean game. I felt like prey had a little bit too much going on it in, was its, a lot to do. in its structure. Uh, but it feels pretty similar of like you, you're suddenly in this, kind of other type world and you're not really sure what's going on a lot of the memos reference like oh attention all employees as a reminder if you suddenly find that you've been in that you've been included in a building shift 
look around you for altered objects Ooh. or any objects of power. If you find an object of power or an altered object, go to your nearest safe room. Close yourself in. Wait for staff to find you. And it's like, why is the building shifting? What does that mean? <laughs> so, it's like really just wonderfully creepy. Again, X-Files fringe type stuff that I think a lot of people really like. Uh, and I, I want everybody to play Control. And nice. I'm not even I mean, I'm not even halfway done with it. I mean, for and real I already though, think it's really good. You sold me on it. Like it was one that I was like, I'll I want to get to it eventually. This makes me want to pick it up and play it immediately. So yeah, I'm gonna do that. We're gonna play through this and we'll have we'll come together and combine our knowledge we'll of this play game. it at night <laughs> yes we'll be maybe frightened if it gets that actually way. i'm not sure if i mentioned this it is a very at least the parts that i'm at um, yeah. are very like dark okay. in terms of the lighting so play it at night Just because otherwise better. you probably won't be able to like see the screen very well cool yeah no I want, i'm into it i want to play this game soon so yeah i'm, Control, gonna, I'm gonna go pick do it, it. Up. i'm gonna go pick it up for sure excellent well if you've played Control. Please don't spoil it for us quite yet, yeah. but we do want to know your thoughts and how. No, and, in fact, keep been, your thoughts to yourself. Keep them to yourself <laughs> until we do the final re- the final review. But still, uh, if you've enjoyed review or any of the games we've talked, uh, re- if you've enjoyed the review, if you did enjoy the review, let us know too. That'd be great. But if you've enjoyed Control, uh, let us know that as well in the comments. We'd love to hear from you. Join us on our Discord so we can talk about it there, or even on social media. All those things, you know, we're available. We want to talk games with you all, so let's do it sometime. Uh, before we go. We do have to do our soundtrack spotlight for the day, which even though we've been talking about control a lot, we haven't Mogan didn't have a selection from that quite yet because there's still a lot more game, a we'll lot more music. It. Yeah, we'll we want to save it. that one for yeah. when we do our review. But we are as kind of a lead in because we were actually we the week this episode comes out is the week of the original release window for Ori and the Will of the Wisp. But since we talked about that earlier, we are going to feature the teaser music from the teaser trailer that was released for Ori and the Will of the Wisps, composed by Gareth Coker. It is just it's more gorgeous. of the Ori and the Blind Forest gorgeousness, but obviously uh, just new versions. So it's it sounds very similar in its in its themes. It has some incredible vocalization in it as well. That just I can only describe I think the Ori soundtracks as euphoric. They're they're just yeah. they're amazingly and just elevate my soul to yeah, listen to. Yeah, it's very them. spiritual. Yes, and so that is very much in place for this teaser music. So we wanted to share that with you all. So again, it's the teaser music for. Ori and the Will of Wisps by Gareth Coker. But listen to that to after the close of the episode, which is pretty much now. Until next time, everybody, I'm one of your hosts, Jarrett Wilson, joined by Rachel Bogan. Are you Come back next week for another fun gaming topic. Until then, stick around for the song. <laughs> <laughs>